The Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2 Among these consequences are difficulties in providing incentives for people to do their best work and dangers of even greater inequalities, both economic and political, as a result of trying to apply the vision of equality to the real world. Pay Differentials among the economic consequences of the passionate pursuit of equality has been a reluctance or unwillingness of institutions or individual employers to pay employees doing the same job a pay differential sufficient to reflect the differences in productivity with which they perform the same duties. Merely a difference in the amount of supervision that employees require can be a considerable economic difference, even if the worker's own individually measured output is the same, since supervisory time is not free and is in fact likely to be more expensive than the time of those being supervised. But whatever the source of the differing value of particular employees to a business, letting one secretary be paid three times the salary of another secretary with the same duties is seldom feasible, for morale reasons if nothing else. The same is generally true in many other occupations. The net result is that attempts to reflect productivity differences with pay differences in order to retain people who might be able to get more money elsewhere often take the form of promotions, real or nominal. An outstanding secretary may, for example, be reclassified as an administrative assistant while doing the same work as before. Such purely nominal promotions do less harm than genuine promotions which remove an employee from the job he performs in outstanding fashion to take on a new job which he may not perform as well or even adequately. Redistribution of Income The redistribution of income is not only an ideological corollary of the passion for equality, it shares similar qualities of moralistic loftiness and analytical vagueness and confusion. As a Fabian socialist, George Bernard Shaw defined socialism as a proposal to divide up the income of the country in a new way. However, most income cannot be redistributed because it was not distributed in the first place. It is paid directly for services rendered, and how much is paid is determined jointly by those individuals rendering the service and those to whom it is rendered. This is obvious in the case of those who shine shoes or practice dentistry, but it is true also of those paid a salary for their work rather than being paid separately for each given service rendered. Some income is in fact distributed, whether it's social security checks, disaster relief aid, agricultural subsidy payments, or the like, but these are two very different processes, and the nature of those processes and their consequences must be understood before deciding to switch from one method of payment to another. No one decides how much a shoeshine boy or a dentist is really worth. In each case, the sum total of their fees is their income after subtracting their respective costs. In short, each customer decides individually how much it is worth to him to have his shoes shined or his teeth fixed. No collectivized or political judgment is necessary. Thus, the competition of the marketplace produces individual fees that add up to annual incomes not predetermined by anybody. Those who benefit directly from these services can determine how much the benefit is worth to them in each instance, rationing their usage according to the market price their own pocketbooks, and the principle of diminishing returns, since few want their shoes or their teeth polished every day. This more or less ideal type of market determination of incomes is modified, but not changed essentially, when people are employed at set salaries. Those more in demand or less in supply are likely to have their salaries set at higher levels. Moreover, those doing a better job are more likely to be retained during layoffs and downsizing and to receive promotions, real or nominal, and pay increases. In short, here too money is paid for services rendered by those directly benefiting and in accordance with the value of those services as judged individually by those directly involved. 
Even in the case of salaried employees, income is not always determined solely by those salaries, as various income earning options are often available after working hours, whether by moonlighting in the same field or some other, or by investing in various ventures from the stock market to real estate to writing the great American novel. What all these various forms of market determination of income have in common is that the income is not distributed. It is directly earned in accordance with its value to others and in the light of competition from other available sources of the same services. To advocate a policy of income redistribution is to advocate not merely a change in statistical outcomes, but a more profound change in the whole process by which people receive pay. The word redistribution is very deceptive insofar as it implies that we simply have distribution A today and should change to distribution B in the future. We are talking about collectivizing and politicizing the economic level of each individual. Such a massive institutional change should stand or fall on its own merits, not be quietly drifted into by soothing words or an innocuous prefix like re. The idea that third parties can determine what someone's work is really worth involves not only incredible arrogance, but intellectual confusion. The very fact that an exchange takes place at all is inconsistent with the existence of any real value that can be objectively discerned by anybody. Someone who pays a quarter for a morning newspaper does so because the value of the newspaper to him is greater than the value of the quarter. But the seller accepts the quarter only because the quarter is worth more to him than the newspaper. If there were any such thing as an objective value of a newspaper, one of these transactors must be a fool. The same is true of any other transaction undertaken in the free market, whether what is being bought and sold are television sets or soybean futures. The medieval notion of a just price, discernible by third-party observers, commits the same fundamental fallacy as comparable worth today. The hollowness of the pretentious formulas used in determining the latter is revealed when the relative rankings of the same occupations differ markedly from one jurisdiction to another. There is no real worth to compare, and the arbitrariness of the process is revealed whenever different individuals operate independently and reach different results. The economic problems likely to arise from having political or bureaucratic authorities determine people's income may be serious, but they are not half the story. A society in which some authorities can weigh millions of their fellow human beings in the balance, determine their worth, and unilaterally dispense their livelihoods as largesse from the government, is a profoundly different kind of society from that created and maintained in the United States of America for more than two centuries. As so often happens, a staggering political inequality can be created in the name of economic equality or social equity. As with so many questions involving equality, the desired state of equality itself is not the real issue especially since such a state of equality seems very unlikely to be achieved. What is crucial are the processes set in motion in hopes of approaching that state. To allow any governmental authority to determine how much money individuals shall be permitted to receive from other individuals produces not only a distortion of the economic processes by undermining incentives for efficiency, it is more fundamentally a monumental concentration of political power which reduces everyone to the level of a client of politicians. Even aside from what this means for freedom and human dignity, it makes virtually inevitable a constant and bitter struggle among all segments of the society for the favor of those who wield this massive power to determine each person's economic well-being. It is a formula for economic, political, and social disaster. Such power has, in a number of countries, led to a nomenclatura whose personal privileges have been a mockery of the very ideals of equality that led to such a concentration of power in pursuit of a mirage. A question must also be raised as to how important and to whom it is to turn the whole economic and political system inside out 
in order to produce numbers more pleasing to observers. Even some passionate advocates of equality have conceded that this is not an overwhelming concern of the general public. R. H. Tawney's landmark book, Equality, condemned the violent contrasts of economic inequality in England and the sharp disparities of circumstance and education to which they led, as well as other social evils he perceived, and yet he saw no groundswell among the English populace for equality. On the contrary, he declared that there was in England a cult of inequality as a principle and an ideal, that inequality was hallowed by tradition and permeated by pious emotions, that even the poor had a tenderly wistful interest in the vacuous doings of the upper ten thousands, toward whom they should presumably be feeling bitter resentment instead. More recently, Professor Ronald Dworkin has proclaimed that a more equal society is a better society, even if its citizens prefer inequality. This is at least a tacit admission that issues of equality arouse no such passion in the general public as among the intelligentsia. That is one of the reasons why vast inequalities of political power must be created in pursuit of economic equality. The only sure winners are those who exalt themselves as the arbiters of the fates of millions. Equality Promoting Inequality the casual assumption that the ideology of equality in theory promotes a more equal society, in fact, is not only unproven, but is a social time bomb. A more unequal and more embittered society can result instead. One of the ways of promoting the ideology of equality is by defining various inequalities of performance out of existence. Thus, cultural relativism refuses to classify some societies as civilized and others as backward or primitive. Whether comparing nations or subgroups within nations, cultural relativists proclaim all cultures and subcultures to be equally valid and entitled to equal respect as we celebrate diversity. Immigrants, for example, are encouraged to continue speaking their foreign languages and preserving their separate cultures, while those black Americans who speak black English are likewise encouraged to continue to do so. Cultures have consequences. Ignoring those consequences while proclaiming equality as a self-justifying ideal does nothing to benefit the less fortunate and in fact tends to freeze them into their backward position while the rest of the world moves forward. The bitter irony is that all this philosophical self-indulgence widens the empirical gap in the name of narrowing it. Hispanics who speak Spanish earn lower incomes than Hispanics who speak English. Poor countries that cling to their cultural ways remain poor, while those that seize upon the things that produced wealth elsewhere tend to become wealthy themselves, Japan being the classic example. No nation was more painfully conscious of being technologically backward than Japan in the 19th century. That is what spurred them on to overtake the West. To have defined their backwardness out of existence would have been to condemn them to unnecessary poverty and thus to contribute to more economic inequality in the world than we have today. While the children of affluent and well-educated parents can usually meet high educational standards better than the children of the less fortunate, lowering those standards or discarding them completely in the name of equality is likely to be especially harmful to the children of the poor and disadvantaged. Children from the homes of educated people with the money to afford books, computers, and other accessories of learning are likely to acquire much fundamental information and behavioral norms at home even if both are neglected in their schools. It is the less fortunate for whom the public school classroom may be the only place in which they are likely to get the basic intellectual and social equipment that they will need for success as adults. Lowering the standards in the public schools may conceal disparities at the moment, but is virtually certain to cause them to be greater in adulthood, at a point at which few can repair their deficiencies. An even deadlier consequence of the quest for equality has been the development of a non-judgmental attitude toward beliefs and behavior. 
One of the most important social lessons of parents to their children in previous generations was to avoid people with bad behavior and not even to listen to them for fear of being fatally misled. Today, schools not only spend more time on classroom discussions of social behavior, they do so non-judgmentally. This means that the ideas of delinquents and hoodlums are put on the same plane as the ideas of students raised to the strictest moral standards. Not only are the latter exposed to the ideas and experiences of the former, they are exposed in a setting where their overt rejection of such ideas and experiences would encounter the condemnation of the teacher. This is only one of many settings in which all people and all ideas are supposed to have equal respect so as not to threaten anyone's self-esteem. The only way to have equal respect is to have respect divorced from behavior and performance, which is to say, to have the word respect lose its meaning. One can dispense self-esteem as the Wizard of Oz dispensed substitutes for heart, courage, and brains, but printing any currency promiscuously destroys its value, and there is no reason to doubt that the same principle applies to the currency of respect. Indeed, the transparent fraudulence of elaborate pretenses of respect are an added insult. In a world where every society and every civilization has borrowed heavily from the cultures of other societies and other civilizations, everyone does not have to go back to square one and discover fire and the wheel for himself when someone else has already discovered it. Europeans did not have to continue copying scrolls by hand after the Chinese invented paper and printing. Malaysia could become the world's leading rubber-producing nation after planting seeds taken from Brazil. Yet the equal respect identity promoters would have each group paint itself into its own little corner with its own insular culture, thus presenting overall a static tableau of diversity rather than the dynamic process of competition on which the progress of the human race has been based for thousands of years. There is yet another way in which the mirage of equality promotes inequality in the real world. Ideological crusades in the name of equality promote envy, the principal victims of which are those doing the envying. The High Cost of Envy Envy was once considered to be one of the seven deadly sins before it became one of the most admired virtues under its new name, social justice. Under either name, it has costs as well as benefits. For some, envy can act as a spur to match the achievements or rewards of others currently more fortunate. This can happen in the case of individuals or in the case of whole nations, such as Japan, whose generations long drive to catch up to the industrialized Western nations, achieved success in the twentieth century. On the other hand, envy can also engender social strife, whose consequences include the possibility that the society as a whole can end up worse off, both materially and psychically, as a result of mutually thwarting activities, including mob violence and civil war. Among nations, a drive to achieve a place in the sun militarily can end in disaster, as happened to Japan in the Second World War, and to Germany in both world wars. The first kind of envy, the more or less natural and potentially beneficial envy that spurs self-development and achievement, creates few incentives for third parties to try to mobilize and heighten it for their own benefit. It is the second kind of envy, expressed in hostility toward others, that is useful for third parties pursuing careers as politicians, group activists, or ideologues. It is this kind of envy which can have high costs to society at large, and to the poor especially. It is not simply that the poor may suffer psychically from having less than others, and from being encouraged to dwell on their current situation, rather than concentrating on improving it, the very terms of the discussion encourage them to attribute their less fortunate position to social barriers, if not political plots, and so to neglect the kinds of efforts and skills which are capable of lifting them to higher economic and social levels. Poorer Groups For the currently less fortunate members of society, 
The costs of envy can be especially high when it misdirects their conceptions and energies. Where poorer people are lacking in human capital, skills, education, discipline, foresight, one of the sources from which they can acquire these things are more prosperous people who have more of these various forms of human capital. This may happen directly through apprenticeship, advice, or formal tutelage, or it may happen indirectly through observation, reflection, and imitation. However, all these ways of advancing out of poverty can be short-circuited by an ideology of envy that attributes the greater prosperity of others to exploitation of people like themselves, to oppression, bias, or unworthy motives such as greed, racism, and the like. Acquisition of human capital in general seems futile under this conception, and acquisition of human capital from exploiters, the greedy, and racists especially distasteful. Often, members of poorer racial, ethnic, or other social groups can acquire the needed human capital more easily from more fortunate members of their own respective groups than from others. However, the ideology of envy can also make their own more successful members suspect as traitors, and therefore also ineligible as either role models or direct sources of advice, skills, or other human capital. What such an ideology does, essentially, is paint the less fortunate into their own little corner, isolated from potential sources of greater prosperity. To the more fortunate, resistance or rebuffs to their attempts to help the less fortunate may be no more than a passing annoyance, but to the less fortunate themselves, this failure to acquire available human capital can be fatal to their own prospects. Whole societies may remain mired in needless poverty, not only because envious visions have created a bogus explanation for their poverty that distracts them from readily available means of becoming more prosperous, but also because envy and fear of envy within these societies inhibit individual striving and innovation. Studies of many poor and primitive societies around the world repeatedly show the paralyzing effects of a pervasive fear of provoking envy among neighbors and relatives. Long before Marxian or other exploitation theories arose, primitive peoples implicitly conceived of the world as a zero-sum game, in which the good fortune of some was the cause of the ill fortune of others, whether in economic terms or in terms of health, love, or other benefits. The cooperation and mutual trust necessary for many kinds of beneficial joint undertakings are more difficult to achieve within this cultural universe, however much such things may be taken for granted in more fortunate societies. Merely transferring capital or technology from these more fortunate societies is seldom sufficient to overcome the cultural handicaps of an envy-stricken society especially when traditional beliefs are buttressed by more sophisticated modern versions of the envy vision spread by the third world intelligentsia, often seconded by the intelligentsia in more fortunate countries. The Dog in the Manger The ultimate in envy is the dog in the manger. In one of Aesop's fables, a horse wants to eat some straw in his manger, but a dog is lying on the straw. Although the dog does not eat straw, he refuses to move so that the horse can eat it, simply because he begrudges the horse the pleasure of eating the straw. The fact that this story has survived for thousands of years suggests that such attitudes are not unknown among human beings. After the First World War, Romania acquired territory from the defeated Central Powers, and these territories included universities that were culturally German or culturally Hungarian. At that point, roughly three-quarters of all Romanians were still illiterate, so the Germans and Hungarians at these universities were not keeping most Romanians from getting a higher education. Nevertheless, the government made it a priority to force Germans and Hungarians out of these universities. Moreover, when ethnically Hungarian students in Romania began going to universities in Hungary, the Romanian government forbade them to do so. Such dog-in-the-manger attitudes are not peculiar to a particular country, race, or civilization. When Nigeria acquired its independence in 1960, 
Many of the civil servants, professionals, and entrepreneurs in northern Nigeria were from tribes in southern Nigeria. One of the top priorities of the political leaders in the north was to force the southerners out of these occupations. Because of huge disparities in education, skill levels, and entrepreneurship between the two regions of the country, there was no realistic hope of replacing southerners with northerners in any timely fashion. But northern political leaders were prepared to hire European expatriates in the interim or to suffer a decline in the services formerly provided by the southerners rather than suffer the blow to their egos of being so dramatically outperformed by their fellow Africans. Similar attitudes existed halfway around the world in Malaysia, where discriminatory policies against the more educated, skilled, and entrepreneurial Chinese minority led many of them to leave the country. It was much the same story in the South Pacific, where the Fiji government's discrimination against the more educated, skilled, and entrepreneurial minority from India caused many of the Indians to immigrate. Dog-in-the-manger attitudes are not confined to situations where there are ethnic differences. Tax policies are often shaped by a desire to soak the rich, whether or not such policies are beneficial to the overall economy or even to the government's tax receipts. One of the most bitterly resented policies of the Reagan administration were tax rate reductions referred to as tax cuts for the rich, even though, one, tax rates in general were cut, two, the government's tax receipts rose after the rates were cut and incomes rose, and three, the upper income brackets not only paid more total taxes than before, but even a higher percentage of all taxes. What was intolerable to critics was that the rich were able to pay these greater sums in taxes as a smaller percentage of their rising incomes. Estate taxes are an even clearer example of dog-in-the-manger attitudes, since they are a trivial proportion of total taxes collected by the government, and it is questionable whether these taxes exceed the collection and compliance costs. But they serve the political purpose of striking a blow against inherited wealth. The dog in the manger was elevated to the level of academic philosophy in John Rawls's A Theory of Justice, where policies that make society in general better off were to be rejected if they did not also make the poorest members of the society better off. In other words, no matter how much any given policy might make vast millions of people better off, any small fraction of people at the bottom were in effect to have a veto over that policy. Even if those at the bottom were not made any worse off, no one else could be allowed to become better off without their participation. This is a particularly striking principle where there are low unemployment rates and many avenues of upward mobility, where those who do not choose to take advantage of these opportunities are to have their interests become preemptive as against the interests of the great majority of people who do. These examples are merely particular illustrations of a more general set of attitudes which exalt envy and seldom count the cost of doing so. These costs include crimes of envy, where the purpose is neither to acquire someone else's possessions nor to avenge any loss of one's own, but simply to lash out against the unfair good fortune of another. Such dog-in-the-manger crimes are often considered senseless or irrational, but they are logical corollaries of the quest for cosmic justice. Even those intellectuals who often attribute collective guilt for individual actions in other contexts, blaming American society for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, for example, seldom apportion any part of the blame for crimes of envy to those like themselves who promote it. Decision Makers Society as a whole can lose opportunities when people in various decision-making capacities have their decisions biased by envy. For example, a former admissions official at an Ivy League college warned prospective applicants not to say or do things that would reveal their educational or economic privileges, as that would tend to bias admissions officials against them. For example, she advised... The best thing you can do if you come from a privileged background is de-emphasize it as best you can. 
For example, if you and your family took a $10,000 vacation to Africa to go on safari, it would probably be best not to write about it on your application. It may rub admissions people the wrong way, since most do not have the money and resources to take such an exotic trip. Since the whole reason for having admissions committees in the first place is to select those applicants best able to make use of costly educational opportunities, envy here serves to undermine that goal when the decision-makers' biases are aroused against students who would otherwise be considered on their qualifications. Nor is this something confined to college admissions committees. Similar reasoning has promoted educational policies which seek to create more equal outcomes for special education students with mental, physical, or psychological handicaps, again with little or no regard for the financial costs of this to the taxpayers or the educational costs to other children in whose classrooms they are to be mainstreamed, often with little regard to the disruptive effects of their special needs. These financial costs can be several times what it costs to educate the average student, while the educational results for a severely mentally retarded student may be imperceptible. The educational cost can also include a substantial part of a teacher's time being devoted to one or a few students to the neglect of the majority. Yet, clearly, it is an injustice from a cosmic perspective that the minds and psyches of some are unable to cope with what ordinary students handle routinely. But just as some students suffer handicaps through no fault of their own, so can other children suffer from mainstreaming policies, likewise through no fault of their own. It is also cosmically unjust that some students are born innately so unusually bright and or have had such unusually favorable environments that they are capable of far higher levels of intellectual achievement than other children their age. One such student was able, in the fourth grade, to score higher than the average high school graduate on the mathematics portion of the scholastic aptitude test. Yet the suggestion that he be given higher levels of mathematics to study than his classmates was rejected by the school principal, and this youngster was assigned to the same fourth grade mathematics as others, on grounds that it would be a violation of social justice if he were given higher levels of mathematics instruction. Nor was this principle unique. A member of a National Commission on Teaching Mathematics opposed teaching computational skills because that means anointing the few who master these skills readily and casting out the many who do not, and urged that we throw off the discriminatory shackles of computational algorithms. More broadly, ability grouping in different classes or in different schools is bitterly opposed by most public school officials on similar grounds. In short, both the mentally gifted and the mentally retarded are to be mainstreamed as part of the quest for cosmic justice, with little or no regard to the costs of this for the students, the taxpayers, or the society into which they are to go as adults. Disregard of effects on third parties are also common on such issues as taxes, price controls, and law enforcement. Tax issues are not simply about whether one class pays more than another, but are also about the repercussions of particular kinds of taxes on economic development and national employment, which affect everyone. Price controls on food have often led to widespread hunger and malnutrition, as suppliers reduced their production and sales of food when this became unprofitable. Undermining law enforcement because of its perceived unfairness to the poor led to skyrocketing crime rates, which hurt the poor worst of all. Envy may cause many issues to be seen in terms transferring benefits from A to B, but policies conceived of this way as transfers do not simply transfer they change behavior in general and in fundamental ways. For example, price controls almost invariably lead to declines in the quantity and quality of what is supplied, to hoarding, and to black markets, whether the price that is being controlled is that of food, housing, gasoline, medical service, or other goods and services. 
The point here is not simply that particular laws and policies have been counterproductive. The more fundamental point is that the whole invidious conception of policymaking spawned by envy is often deadly in its general effects on the society as a whole. Authority and Differentiation One of the most thoughtless and dangerous consequences of pursuing the mirage of equality and its accompanying envy has been a pervasive reaction against all forms of authority or even social differentiation. By authority is meant here the ability to get others to do things without either forcing them or convincing them. The classic example would be a physician who gives a patient a prescription to take based on chemical, biological, and medical principles with which the patient is wholly unfamiliar. The patient simply relies on the physician's authority. Much of what children do is likewise based on their parents' authority. They learn the alphabet because their parents want them to, not because the children themselves understand the enormous ramifications of learning those particular 26 symbols in an arbitrarily specified order. The mere sorting of people by such common titles as Mr. and Miss, and the differentiation of people by having adults address children one way and children address adults another, are all repugnant to many who pursue the mirage of equality. The practice of putting everyone, friends and strangers, young and old, on a first-name basis is one of the symptoms of this mindset. Much more serious are the systematic undermining of parental authority, which can be found in public school textbooks and other materials, which depict all sorts of moral and intellectual issues as things which each person must decide for himself or herself, not according to what has been taught by parents or by an always suspect society. It would be hard to imagine a more reckless gamble than encouraging youngsters with less than a decade of experience in the most elementary aspects of life to substitute that narrowly circumscribed experience and their own undeveloped reasoning processes for principles distilled from the experiences of millions of adults over generations of time. The child's own personal safety is often at stake in his willingness to respond to the imperative tone of a parent in situations where there is no time to explain, or where the child does not yet have a sufficient background of experience to understand an explanation. The verbal differentiation which reminds everyone of his own role, calling people mother and father instead of by their first name, differentiation in dress, manner, or otherwise, are all methods of establishing a social hierarchy that serves social purpose. But those to whom equality is an overriding moral imperative see in all this only personal privilege and oppression. Yet authority may serve those who do not have it more than it does those who do. The parent who understands the underlying reasons for the things told to a child is benefited less by authority than the child who does not understand those realities and who needs to observe the cautions and apply the rules nevertheless. The specialized knowledge of the scientist, the physician, or the military commander is likewise used primarily to guide the actions of others who lack that knowledge and who would be much worse off to operate in ignorance. Authority is one of the ways of using the knowledge of some for the benefit of others. Like everything human, authority is imperfect and subject to abuse, so it cannot be unlimited, and it is not. But to invoke the blanket slogan, Question Authority, is to raise the question, By what authority do you tell us to question authority? For authority to exist, there must have been some process by which particular people came to be regarded as more reliable guides than others. But there is no comparable process by which others come to be qualified to proclaim the dogma, Question Authority. Why should our skepticism be focused on those who have already been through some testing and weeding out process, and our trust be given to those who have not? Authority is only one form of social differentiation. Even among people on the same social plane, various forms of address indicate differing levels of familiarity or intimacy, or differing levels of levity or seriousness as of a given moment. All of these things imply that social context matters, 
which is to say that we cannot interact atomistically and ad hoc without great costs and even dangers. Thus, the same person may be Mr. Smith, Harry, Daddy, Lieutenant Smith, Lefty, or Honey in different contexts. Reminders of where we stand in relationship to different people are nothing more than admissions that we cannot play everything in life by ear without risking getting very badly out of harmony with others. All are made worse off without these verbal aids, and those most vulnerable are put at the greatest risk and the mirage of equality banishes such differentiation. One of the most important social differentiations has now become passé and disdained, the distinction between the respectable poor and the disreputable poor. At one time, those who were poor could nevertheless take pride in their independence and self-sufficiency, even though they were at an economic and social level below that of the middle class. The respectable poor had the norms of society at large on their side, and the bad example of the disreputable poor as warnings to be used when they raised their children to be respectable people. Indeed, the children of the disreputable poor knew that their respectable neighbors were more highly regarded, thus providing incentives for some of these children to try to rise out of their position at the bottom of the social scale. The welfare state, however, has made many of the respectable, self-supporting poor look like chumps, as the government has lavished innumerable programs on those who violate all rules and refuse to take responsibility for themselves. Now the incentives are reversed, tempting some of the respectable poor to take advantage of benefits available to those who are able to live without work, without saving for the future, and without even having to pay for a roof over their heads. The Insatiability of Envy Envy is insatiable in at least two different senses. One, no conceivable redistribution of income, wealth, or other benefits will satisfy everyone, so there is no logical or political stopping point in the process. Therefore, the question is not which particular distribution is better or best, but whether the benefits of setting in motion a never-ending quest offers more potential for good or ill. Two, there is no unique and definitive rank ordering of the innumerable advantages and disadvantages that individuals and groups may have simultaneously. Thus, A can be envying B because of the latter's advantages, while B is envying A because of the former's advantages. Even in the simplest case, where both parties perceive A to have net advantages over B, redress is by no means always possible quite aside from whether it is likely or likely to be acquiesced in by A. As a study of envy put it, the more one seeks to deprive the envious man of his ostensible reason for envy by giving him presents and doing him good turns, the more one demonstrates one's superiority and stresses how little the gifts will be missed. Were one to strip oneself of every possession, such a demonstration of goodness would still humiliate him so that his envy would be transferred from one's possessions to one's character. And if one were to raise him to one's own level, this artificially established equality would not make him in the least happy. He would again envy, firstly, the benefactor's character, and secondly, the recollection retained by the benefactor during this period of his erstwhile material superiority. The difficulties of satisfying envy under even these very simple and extreme conditions increase exponentially when there is no unambiguous way to say that A is better off than B in whatever dimension each values. Many parents, for example, are familiar with the situation in which each child thinks that a sibling is being treated better by the parents, and therefore each has envy and resentment of the other or others. Nor can an objective third party, if one could be found, necessarily be able to declare which person has the net advantage when one is more fortunate according to one array of characteristics and possessions, and the other is more fortunate according to another array of characteristics and possessions. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1.